are continuing with our safari engage to, and today our lesson is on influencing the mountain of religion and philosophy. Um, my name is Jotham Munene. I'm going to be taking you through this lesson, currently now serving at Sitam Mombasa. Welcome. As we have been talking about the seven mountains of influence, we now come to the mountain of religion and philosophy, which is a key area of influence. Um, you might be aware that there are several major religions in the world. These include Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, Judaism, and Christianity, which is, of course, not just a religion. In fact, it is a way of life, a way of being connected with God, a way of finding access to God himself and being led by him and eventually being sure of eternal life. And so every religion is trying to have influence. Then there are philosophies also that are also trying to have influence. And this lesson calls the Christian to the importance of this mountain to know what we can do and to also know what goes wrong when the church is not fulfilling her mandate in influencing the mountain of religion and philosophy. The aim of this lesson is that the participant will be able to bring kingdom principles to influence the mountain of religion and philosophy. We have three key objectives. Number one, that we will be able to identify biblical ways in which we can influence the religion and philosophy in our society today. Secondly, by the end of this lesson, we hope to be able to appreciate the fact that many Christians have participated minimally in influencing this mountain and what we can do to remedy or fix that. Thirdly, our third objective is that you and I will be able to commit to seek avenues to personally bring God's kingdom influence in this mountain of religion and philosophy. We begin with a short discussion. In your group, uh, two or three, in your Bible study, wherever you are studying this lesson, would like you to discuss this. Religion is the opium of the poor, of the poop, of the people rather. Religion is the opium of the people by uh, this statement is attributed to Karl Marx. Would like you to discuss, A, do you agree with this statement? And B, why or why not? Let us look at four areas under this uh, subject. Number one, understanding religion and philosophy. Understanding religion and philosophy. And begin with a definition. The Oxford Dictionary defines religion as the belief in and worship of a superhuman controlling power, especially a personal God or gods. John Milton defines religion as a system of beliefs and practices by means of which a group of people struggles with the ultimate problems of human life. That word ultimate is key. Questions of being, questions of where we come from, questions of why we are around. Now, in explaining a little further, uh, the late Dr. John S. Beatty, great uh, theologian and uh, religion scholar, says that a people's religion can be observed when you look at rituals, sacred places, symbols, proverbs, names, and, uh, and, 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 you know, and customs from his book there, Introduction to African Religion. Of course, he is looking very much at the African context, which may not have things written down, but nonetheless, you can still see what the religion is uh, based on those issues that you look at. Now, what is philosophy? We'll 
Look at a definition from Cambridge Dictionary. Philosophy is the use of reason in understanding such things as the nature of the real world and existence, the use and limits of knowledge, and the principles of moral judgment. You can see that philosophy also deals with the big questions of life. Questions like, where did we come from? Questions like, why are we here? And they are the same questions, really, that religion is focusing on. But in philosophy, we are using human reason, basically, to look and engage in the same issues. So religion and philosophy are key. And we want to find out why are they important? Or why is it important for us as believers to have the kingdom of God influence this mountain? Why is it important? All right? So religion and philosophy have a direct bearing in our worldview, and they affect how we live our lives. They, di they directly affect our values and our morals. By the way, if you are following along with your manual, uh, you will see the highlighted uh, you know, words or phrases, and we encourage you to fill them so that it keeps you also uh, active in this discussion. The scripture given there is Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 31 to 32, which says, They have built the high places of Topheth in the valley of Ben Hinnom to burn their sons and daughters in the fire, something I did not command, nor did it enter my mind. So here, the children of Israel were getting carried away by other religions, other philosophies. And one of the things that they were doing is that they were burning their children in fire, as like offering them to these gods. And this today would be the equivalent of abortion, where unborn children are also sacrificed at the altar, I believe, of the same kind of God. And it is based on your underlying worldview, which is informed by your religion and your philosophy. So we are asking the question, why is it important for us to uh, bring in the kingdom of God to bear on this mountain? Number one, religion and philosophy directly influence societal views. Religion and philosophy directly influence societal views. And if we are not careful, it just keeps going. Things just keep getting worse until our views are completely messed up. The scripture reference is Acts 19 from verse 26. It says, and you see and hear how this fellow Paul has convinced and led astray large numbers of people here in Ephesus and in, uh, in practically the whole province of Asia. He says that man-made gods are no gods at all. There is danger not only that our trade will lose its good name, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis will be discredited and the goddess herself, who is worshipped all over Asia, province of Asia and the world, will be robbed of her divine majesty. When they heard this, they were furious and began uh, shouting, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. This was in the second missionary journey that Paul made. And the people who are selling idols, you know, images of uh, Diana or Artemis, began to realize that business is being affected because he is shifting the understanding of religion. You see, religion and philosophy affect very many other areas of our lives, and it caused a big uproar, showing you that this affects business, politics, and many other things in our lives, even education. Number two, why the kingdom of God must be brought to, to, to influence this mountain is that religion and philosophy can make it easy or difficult to advance the kingdom of God, to advance the kingdom of God. They can either make it easy or difficult. Story is given in Acts chapter 17, where Paul again was going 
through the city of Athens and looked at several gods they had. And he said, for as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar to this inscription to an unknown God. Now, what you worship is something unknown I am going to proclaim to you. In their religion, the Athenians knew something about an unknown God. Because of that, it made it easy for Paul to find a reference point. Therefore, religion and philosophy is important for us to understand in order to know how to approach different cultures, different communities as we bring them to the knowledge of the kingdom of God. And we'll have another example later on in that regard. Number three, religion and philosophy is, is important for us to deal with them or to influence them through the kingdom of God because they have been used by the devil to cause havoc in the world. Religion and philosophy have been used by the devil to cause havoc in the world. We know of philosophies or worldviews like communism, anti-Semitism, uh, and, and, and so on that have been used to bring about dictatorships, to bring about killing of certain peoples that are considered less human due to the understanding brought about by people's philosophies and religion. Therefore, it is dangerous and it is used by the devil, as 1 Peter 5, 8 tells us, to be alert and of, of, of a sober mind because our enemy, the devil, prowls aloud around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. He says, resist him standing firm in the faith because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. This, all these kinds of things happening are really coming out of particular worldview based on a particular philosophy. Communism, for instance, said that there is no God, that there is an evolution. People are evolving to become better people, and that caused untold deaths of people. Hitler also was basing on a certain philosophy, and unfortunately also religion, to do the atrocities that he carried out. Therefore, we must always be on the watch concerning religion and philosophy in any given society. The third thing we want to look at is how do we, as believers, serve God in this mountain? How do we engage in this area of influence called religion and philosophy? We'll look at several ways. Number one, beware of unbiblical philosophy. We are calling believers to beware. Colossians 2.8 says, Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world and not according to Christ. You must beware that behind activities going on, behind media campaigns, behind Orc education and art and different areas of human engagement, there are unbiblical philosophies behind it. And you, you do that through, uh, you know, reading up and generally understanding all kinds of philosophies. As religions, like I said, understand Islam, understand Hinduism, understand and whatever is called non-religions also. Understand evolution, narcissism, hedonism, and other religions and philosophies that are there. Beware of that. Number two, we as Christians need to be intellectually and spiritually prepared to engage the philosophies of this world. We need to be intellectually and spiritually prepared to engage the philosophies of this world. And our example again is the apostle Paul in this example I already gave of his interaction with the people at Mars Hill in Athens. In fact, he met with the, 
Today it will be an equivalent of a public lecture at a public university, University of Nairobi, where he engages with people who are into, if you look at verse 18 there, some were Epicurean and other Stoic philosophers. And he was able to engage them because he must have read before and known who these people are. So we need to be intellectually, spiritually prepared. We also need to challenge people to make a decision on which religion to follow. Whenever we have a chance in our workplace, in our schools, in our neighborhoods, in the, the parties people hold, in events, family reunions, and other things that we have, we need to, whenever we get a chance to challenge the people we are interacting with, that it is important to make a decision on which religion to belong to. Joshua did this towards the end of his life. In Joshua 24, verse 15, he told the Israelis, if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves today whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that are on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites, in whose land you dwell. But as for me and, and my house, we will serve the Lord. Let me just pause there a little bit and address another area of religion, in fact, religions that may pass. And this is the African traditional religions. And sometimes Christians are unaware of what goes on and where we came from. Like Joshua tells these people, you came from a different past. And we too came from a different, uh, you know, heritage in terms of religion. And some of those things are beginning to come back to us. And many Christians seem to be unaware and many times actually are getting themselves involved in some of these uh, religions. We ourselves must make up our mind, whether it is the African religion, whether it is Buddhism, whether it is Baha'ism, whether it is Jesus that we are following. And then we must take every opportunity to challenge people to make a decision of where or who they are going to worship. Fourthly, what can we do? We need to promote and practice true religion which brings God's blessing to a nation. As we promote, as we talk about it, we must also be ready to live the life uh, that comes from the revelation of God through Jesus Christ. And that brings God's blessing to a nation. And we can give examples. We, we, we know very well examples like uh, the US of A once followed the God of the Bible. We know a revival that took place some years ago in Fiji. In fact, the Fiji case was quite amazing. When people turned back to the God of the Bible, the whole, uh, the, the nature itself seems to respond. They seem to catch the, the ponds that didn't have, rivers that didn't have fish began to have fish. The, the land began to produce things. So there is a blessing when a nation, God willing, the whole, as much as possible, a, a big percentage following the goal of the Bible, you get a blessing. The Bible says, Psalms 33, 12, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he has chosen as his own inheritance. The implication of this is this. In today's world, there are religions and philosophies that are clearly working hard to define for us our views on morality, human rights, and the way we govern ourselves. Human rights is a big topic, but many times it is coached with a certain agenda coming from a certain worldview and philosophy. These things endeavor to influence people's opinion through media, education, and so on. And we as Christians must not close our eyes, but must seek to spread the truth of the God of the Bible in all the arenas in which God has placed us. Finally, we want to ask the question, what do we stand to lose if we do not engage? What do we stand to lose if we do not engage in um, 
the religion and philosophy mountain. If we don't do anything, is there anything to lose? And, and you bet there, is, there are serious repercussions. Number one, our children will be swayed to other faiths. Psalm 78, 4, the people of God said, we will not hide them, meaning the teachings about the Lord, from their children. We will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord, his power and the wonders he has done. So our children are growing in a world that talks a lot about relativism that says we must respect everyone's point of view. That way of thinking is very major, especially in higher education. So that through that, same gender relationships, abortion, idolatry, Eastern practices, you know, Eastern faith practices have been, are being incorporated into mainstream education. And you will notice very, it's very subtly that Christianity is the only thing that is not being allowed to also have its voice in the public arena. The philosophies and re other religions are not only using, uh, you know, education, universities, schools, but they are also going through media, social media, but also the traditional media. In fact, Islam has a serious, well-planned agenda to change and, and bring the world to know more about Islam through the world's media. So if we are not deliberate about helping our children understand where we are coming from, and standing in this mountain, they will be swayed to other faiths. Number two, the trend in the world system is to silence Christian views, or rather religious views, but especially Christianity. And this is not the first time this has happened in history. In Daniel chapter 6 verse 12, the adversaries of Daniel went to the king and spoke to him about his royal decree. Did you not publish a decree that during the next 30 days, anyone who prays to any god or man except to you, O king, would be thrown into the lion's den? And so where we are headed is a place where the lion's den is specifically organized Sometimes just for any religious view, but many times for Christianity. So therefore, where we have a voice, where God has given us, some of the people listening to me are in public policy. You are in government. You are in setting, in a place where you, you engage in setting curriculum. You are in a board of an educational institution. You are in some county assembly. You are involved in uh, a local group in some way. You have to speak because if we don't, this idea of silencing religious views and Christianity will continue until a time when we'll be controlled even in what we preach on the pulpit. This is the trend. If we don't do something, we'll be silenced. But three, if we are not careful, laws will be crafted to silence the Christian or to reduce the impact of the Bible in society. Laws are being made very slowly to answer a given direction. Other people of other faiths are always very much aware of any laws that are being made. But sometimes Christians are very quiet and engaging only in prayer, which is very important but we must as well get involved in lawmaking because if we are not careful in the next few years, it is going to be very difficult for us. Because the people we are dealing with, Romans 125, exchanged the truth of God for a lie. And they worshipped and subcreated things 
rather than the creator who is forever praised. Amen. Because many nations of the world now are going to a democracy. Democracy is the will of the majority. A point will reach when they will say, let's exchange the truth of God for the lie. So for example, evolution as a means of origin is taught almost as fact in some institutions of learning. Creation by our intelligence, whom, who is God, is sometimes frowned upon as if it is of lesser minds. And yet, if you reason carefully, you realize it takes as much faith to believe in a world coming out of nothing as that there is a God who put everything in place. So these laws will be made to silence our voice uh, unless we are careful to speak into religion and philosophy uh, in our societies. Number four, what will happen if we don't speak? Our institutions will become more secular, leading to God's judgment. However, in Deuteronomy 28, if you do not obey the Lord your God and do not carefully follow all his commands and decrees, I'm giving you today, all these curses will come upon you and will overtake you. So there is judgment. There is judgment. When our institutions all become completely secular, when, um, you know, like right now in Kenya, in parliament, they open with prayer. But a point will reach where they might say, we cannot have religion in, in secular life. So as we continue becoming secular, in, in all spheres of life, this can end up in God's favor being uh, removed from us, adding up as in judgment. Fifthly, if we don't do something as believers, we will have failed in our role as Christians, as believers. Did you know you have a role to explain what you believe? You do not have a right to hold it to yourself and say this is my private belief, which is what the world would like us to say. Peter, the disciple of the Lord, says this, 1 Peter 3.15, But in your heart set apart Christ as Lord, always being prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. So if we are not speaking, then we have disobeyed, you know, this command in scripture that we always be prepared to explain why we believe uh, what we believe. In conclusion, religion and philosophy will always be key, or rather a key root to the hearts and minds of people. We must prepare ourselves as followers of Jesus Christ to defend the faith and wisely present the case for putting our trust in the gospel and recognizing that Jesus is the only way to God the Father and eternal life. We should not only be good students of the word of God, but also consistent doers of the word in all areas of life. So we don't just speak but we also become practitioners of the faith that we believe in so that it will attract people and that we will have influence. We will be the salt of the earth. We will be engaging in order to move the world and the people away from godless philosophies and religions of the evil one. By the way, as we close, let us just appreciate that there is really no other religion. There is really no other truth. It is either the God who made the heaven and the earth or many other religions and philosophies that are a tool of the enemy to draw people 
away from God as happened at Babel. So it is our job to continue uh, influencing religion and philosophy. Now I want to remind you that after this, we encourage you to go through the daily devotions. Every day there is something from the lesson to reflect upon and help you more into action. Then we do have the safari group lesson that you do as a group with your safari group. And finally, there is a portion for the safari partners, meaning two or three people that meet together to challenge one another and see whether indeed we are following uh, the things that the Lord is bringing our way. So I hope this lesson has been a blessing and it will be a blessing if you do something tangible about it to engage and to influence the mountain of religion and philosophy. Thank you and God bless you as we continue with the safari. Yes, my name is uh, Aya Fode Kabenje and uh, I'm General Secretary of the Association of Evangelicals in Africa and um, Sierra Leonean by nationality. My mom, I didn't know her as a Christian. In fact, I grew up in my grandparents' homestead and uh, my grandparents were traditional African religionists, if I can put it that way. In other words, they were neither Christians or Muslims, <laughs> like we know, but uh, does that mean they didn't have a spiritual life? They did. Uh, I saw them do their thing under the tree, on the, by, the, by the stone, did invocations and so on. And I took part in it. They made sacrifices, maybe killed a chicken. I didn't know wh why I was doing that, but on hindsight, I knew exactly this is a traditional African belief, so I would definitely say that's my background. However, as God will have it, in the village, in front of my grandfather's house, was the village church. So as a little boy, we used to go sit on the floor, enjoy the singing, because people are gathered there. So I would say that's my first exposure to Christianity. Anyway, fast forward, I think my mother became a staunch Christian later in the village and in fact took care of the pastor who commuted to the village every Saturday afternoon to conduct service on Sunday. I then went to the to the to a secondary school where this pastor who came to my village lived. And because of the connection with my mom, I I stayed in his home. And one of the older boys in the home of that pastor was a member of the scripture union in, uh, in the high school. He invited me to that scripture union meeting. And that's really for myself, the beginning of a real Christian encounter. So what happened in scripture union? Number one, I think I like the emphasis on reading the Bible for yourself. I was impressed by the first Christians I encounter in that first exposure. And I've continued to see that. In other words, other people have been examples for me. And, uh, and I've also seen how my own life has encouraged others. It's a chain reaction. And that is an encouragement to me not to let those people down. And even as I continue, to look up to these others. Like Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. As a disciple, I always remember that. My mentor will always tell me, for instance, in our part of the world, today I hear that in Kenya, people labor churches, Bible-believing church, and non-Bible-believing church. By the way, I don't like those categorizations. And why so? we are faced with that kind of situation. Back home, we'll say a born-again church and a non-born-again church. My mentor said, don't call, no. And sometimes we, we said a church had fire and there was one that did not add fire. Whatever that means. However, uh, we are trained to say, don't, 
don't say a church as in God fire. And uh, if you are fire, give it fire. Have a responsible church membership. Our world is evil and there is a lot. So we draw strength from one another. We get encouragement. In America today, even in global Christianity, even in Europe, people are beginning to ask questions. Should we call ourselves evangelicals? Because other people define who we are and make a bad testimony of who we are. So how we counter that, as you say, we carry the Holy Spirit, is by our works. We are not saved by works, but we are saved to do good works and our love. By our love, people we believe, by our unity. And perhaps the question you ask is even more critical because of our division as a church. We just think, oh, uh, maybe I'm, me, I'm Sitam. If you're among Sitam, I'm Woodley, I'm on Valley Road. And uh, that kind of thing weakens our effort. If we really understand the kingdom of God, the big K, and not the small kingdoms we build, <laughs> You know, which is very characteristic of the church, by the way. And this is why the world is going where we are. Like uh, when you don't have power, you're, 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 you blame uh, the power suppliers. You blame them, right? And the Bible says, you, me, are the light of the world, the salt of the earth. If there is no light in the world, as you are describing, if the world is going where it is, the problem is with the church. So the church needs to stand up. And uh, if you ask me, part of that is our love for one another. The Bible makes that clear. The way the world we see love among us and uh, our unity. You know, by our oneness, by our love, we would conquer the world through the power of the Holy Spirit. We tend to have a spiritual life different from our physical life. <laughs> we tend to look at what happens in the four walls of the church as uh, the Christianity we engage. But when we go to the office, we are somebody else. And I think that should not be. Christianity is all of life, whether in the farm, in the, in the marketplace. Are you consciously knowing and when, again, when we engage the Bible, the Bible does not just give us a life and talk about life in the, in the church and not in the marketplace. Again, this is our own categorization and division. We play again into the hands of those divisions. All of our life, all, you know, Christianity has to be holistic, whether it's in school, if everybody is cheating, we cheat and forget that we are Christians and there we are on church on Sunday. In fact, somebody uses the expression that we are Christians on Sunday, Monday to Saturday, something else. Maybe that's, that's the, 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 the rest of the place we are is in the marketplace. We have Monday to Saturday to spend in the marketplace. And if I can analyze your question, are we Christians in the marketplace? Monday to Saturday when we are not in church. We should be because we carry in us. For that's why God, God did not say, I give you the Holy Spirit on Saturday to empower you to go to church. But I dwell in you. Your body, as you say, carry you. So wherever you carry that body, how are you manifesting the authority, the, the, the grace, the, uh, all the implications of being a born-again Christian? <music>